always been fascinated by the movement of snakes, the way that they're able to twist and writhe to achieve motion, the sinusoidal movements of their bodies. The snake can really be thought of as one long vertebral column. In the previous lesson, we discussed the types of movements of the vertebral column. Though not as complex as those seen in the snake, perhaps, they're still pretty interesting in their own respect. We continue this discussion today with a look at the muscles that generate these motions. Good day, and welcome to the second installment of the Gross Anatomy video podcast series. With the vertebral framework now in place, we can now look at the individual muscles that attach the vertebral processes. Good news, this session is much shorter than the previous session, so you should be able to get it through it much quicker. Now, that being said, this is also the first session to incorporate a supplemental video known as a kinesthetic learning exercise, or KLE for short. This is basically an opportunity for you to draw out the individual muscles. It's really designed for kinesthetic or hands-on learners. So if you identify yourself as a sort, you might get a lot out of the experience. You can watch the videos to the YouTube channel or you can download them from the Blackboard page. You can also download and print off the skeletal images that provide the framework for drawing out the muscles. It's entirely optional and presents no new information that isn't already in the podcast. It just offers another learning approach that can be used in conjunction with the podcast. Some people love them, other people hate them. From my experience, it's about a 50-50 mix. It's entirely up to you whether you want to make use of them or not, but seeing as this is the first time you're experiencing it, and also seeing as this is a shorter podcast than usual, I hope that everyone at least gives it a try. The lecture is divided into two segments based on a broad classification system we use for grouping the muscles at the back. The first group involves muscles that both originate and insert on the vertebral column, although at different levels. These are the intrinsic muscles at the back. They're involved in movement of the back and the vertebral column and are segmentally innervated by the posterior running branches coming off the spinal nerves. These are commonly referred to as the dorsal primary rami. Now we'll get back to these in the second session. The second group, known as the extrinsic muscles of the back, originate off the vertebral column but insert on bones of the appendicular skeleton. They are therefore involved in movements of the upper limb, using the vertebral column as an anchor for the pull of muscle. For the most part, they are innervated by the ventral primary rami, or principal anterior branch of the spinal nerve. As you progress through the dissection, superficial degree, you'll generally encounter the extrinsic muscles first, so these will be the focus of the first session. On the completion of this session, you should be able to recall the names of the extrinsic back muscles and identify them in a picture or a dissection, and describe their origin, insertion, their neurovascular supply, and the movements that they generate during contraction. You should also be able to use surface landmarks to localize these muscles under the skin. This is a critical skill in diagnosis of musculoskeletal conditions and of manual massage therapy techniques. Finally, we'll look at a few clinically related conditions, including something known as drop shoulder syndrome. We begin our discussion with the most superficial of the muscles of the back. This is the trapezius muscle, so named because of its trapezoidal shape. Trapezius has an extensive origin. Superiorly, it arises from the nuchal ligament, a continuation of the supraspinous ligament and the external occipital protuberance and superior nuchal line. Inferiorly, trapezius continues to originate off the spinous processes as low as the 12th thoracic vertebrae. The muscle fibers project laterally, converging upon the spine of the scapula and wrapping around anterior to also originate off the acromion process and lateral third of the clavicle. The vascular supply to trapezius is through the transverse cervical and dorsal scapular arteries. Now, a moment ago, I mentioned that most of the extrinsic muscles are innervated by branches off the ventral primary rami. This is the one exception to that rule. Trapezius is innervated by the 11th cranial nerve, commonly known as the spinal accessory nerve. The function of trapezius is complex, depending on the specific fibers contracting. It's important to remember that we have precise control over activating specific regions within a muscle, rather than having to fully activate a muscle all at once. Selective activation of the superior fibers of trapezius results in scapular elevation and slight upward rotation of the scapula. 
Conversely, selective activation of the inferior fibers results in scapular depression and slight downward rotation. Selective activation of the middle fibers or maximal activation of the entire muscle results in scapular retraction towards the vertebral column. Clinically, the trapezius plays a role in maintaining proper alignment of the shoulder girdle. Weakness in the upper fibers, for example, results in the condition known as dropped shoulder syndrome, which can result in impingement in a number of neurovascular structures supplying the upper limb under the collapsed clavicle. We'll return to this in a later lesson. Inferior to trapezius is latissimus dorsi, a broad, flat muscle that gives muscular individuals a V-shaped appearance. The term latissimus dorsi is from the Latin, meaning broadest of the back, which certainly describes this muscle. It again has a broad origin directly off the spinous processes from T7 and below. In the lumbar region, the tendon for latissimus dorsi takes the form of an aponeurosis, a broad, flat appearance seen in numerous places in the body. In this instance, this aponeurosis is given the specific name thoracolumbar fascia, through which the latissimus dorsi attaches to the spinous processes of the lumbar vertebrae and the iliac crest. It's also not uncommon to see latissimus dorsi originate off the lower three or four ribs. As with trapezius, the fibers for the latissimus dorsi converge on a small insertion point on the anterior surface of the humerus, known as the medial lip of the bicipital groove. The latissimus dorsi is primarily involved in adduction of the shoulder joint. Normally, this action is accomplished passively by gravity. The latissimus dorsi is therefore reserved for activities requiring greater levels of force, such as uh, pull-to-stand movement and activities such as wall climbing. Because of the way that the fibers wrap around to the front of the humerus, it's also a shoulder extensor and a medial rotator, as well as a depressor of the scapula. The latissimus dorsi is innervated by the thoracodorsal nerve and receives its vascular supply from the thoracodorsal artery. Lying deep to trapezius is the levator scapulae muscle. It has a rounded appearance with fibers running parallel to each other along the course of the belly. It originates off the posterior tubercles of the transverse processes of C1 through C4 and runs inferiorly to insert on the superior angle of the scapula. As the name implies, the levator scapulae works with the upper fibers of trapezius to elevate the scapula. Its vascular supply is from the dorsal scapular artery and it's innervated by the dorsal scapular nerve. The rhomboids are a pair of muscles once again named for their geometric appearance. They run from the vertebral column at an oblique infralateral angle to insert on the medial border of the scapula. Rhomboidius minor typically originates off C7 and T1 spinous processes, while rhomboidius major originates off spinous processes T2 through T5. The rhomboids work with trapezius to retract and inferiorly rotate the scapula, similar to levator scapulae. Their neurovascular supply is from the dorsal scapular artery and nerve. The serratus posterior muscles get their name from the serrated sawtooth appearance associated with their insertion on the ribs. The serratus posterior superior originates off the spinous processes of C7 through T3 and part of the nuchal ligament and runs inferiorly to insert on ribs 2 through 4 and sometimes 5. The serratus posterior inferior originates off the spinous processes of the 11th thoracic through 2nd lumbar vertebrae and runs superiorly to insert on the ribs 8 through 12. They receive their neurovascular supply segmentally through intercostal vessels and nerves. The action of these muscles is a matter of debate. Based on the line of pull, they are argued to assist with respiration, with the superior muscles raising the ribs to assist with inspiration and the inferior muscles lowering the ribs to assist with expiration. Based on their small size and the fact that they amount to little more than connective tissue in frail individuals, their contribution in this role is probably minimal. It's more likely that they play a role in proprioception, providing sensory feedback on the degree of anterolateral flexion and rotation of the vertebral column. That does it for the extrinsic muscles of the back. In the second session, we'll take a look at the intrinsic muscles of the back, which include the erector spinae, transversal spinalis, and suboccipital muscle groups. Take some time to pause and reflect, and we'll see you after the break.